and we'll read through the, the whole of David's prayer there. So if you would stand for the reading of Holy Scripture. First Chronicles 29, beginning at verse 10. This is God's word. Therefore, David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, And of your own have we given you, for we are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all, and that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. Then David said to all the assembly, Bless the Lord your God. And all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their fathers, and bowed their heads and paid homage to the Lord and to the king. And they offered sacrifices to the Lord. And on the next day offered burnt offerings to the Lord, a thousand bulls, a thousand rams, And a thousand lambs with their drink offerings and sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. And they ate and drank before the Lord on that day with great gladness. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever. By his grace and mercy may be preached for you. You may be seated. And as we come to think about how this passage helps us as we round out our study and reflection of the Lord's Prayer, let us pray for God's help. Almighty God, uh, as we come to this passage and to the, the last bit, the conclusion of the Lord's Prayer, uh, might you give us insight into how this would direct us in our prayers? How might it strengthen us for the task of prayer and for our enthusiasm and encouragement in prayer? Might we see how this These final reflections of sorts are a fitting way to close out how we would address you. And so might all the things that we have considered about this profile for prayer um, and culminating here be added to us that we might be renewed in our diligence, vigilance and pursuit of the practice of prayer. And might that not just be because it is something we feel we ought to do, but something that we know is good for us and is wonderful and is honoring to you. Overcome the deficiencies of the preacher. They are significant. And bless the reading and the preaching of your holy word to bring forth fruit in our hearts that we would love you more, that we would serve you better. We ask it all in the precious name of Christ our Savior. Amen. If you were to inherit a 
Fabergé egg, which, um, despite how I know everyone is um, high cultured uh, in our congregation, it's one of those jewel encrusted eggs, just so that we, we know we're on the same page, one of those jewel encrusted uh, egg shaped most famous pieces of jewelry coming from uh, Russia. Uh, if you inherited one of these Fabergé eggs, you would probably not feel comfortable displaying it on a rickety stand made of scrap wood set aside uh, an old rusty piece of patio furniture. Um, we know that that just seems out of place, incongruous. We know that valuable things deserve a noble place to rest. We want some sort, some sort of elegant furniture, as well as a reliable and respectable stand that would well fit the task of holding up this priceless thing to display. And the same ought to be true of our prayers. In prayer, we have this priceless opportunity to lift up our concerns for God's glory and for our well-being We get to lift these things before God himself. And we have this amazing privilege of addressing the God of the universe with our praises and petitions. And since we know this opportunity is priceless, we should want a a fitting way to rest those petitions as we hold them before the Lord. And so we come to the conclusion to the Lord's prayer for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This conclusion is a that's not the end of the sermon. That's the end of the, the prayers, by the way. So we're clear. This conclusion is a is a reminder of heavenly realities at the end of our petitions and is a fitting setting or, or way to to rest our prayers as we display them in closing before God. It's a fitting way to lift our petitions to heaven where God is and where he hears them to respond, even with mercy and with might, as the kingdom, the power and the glory belong to him. Now, the Lord's Prayer, as we have seen through the past several weeks, is a profile for prayer that has taught us about the major components that should feature in our prayers. The the preface and the six petitions have shown us how to order and to develop our concerns in prayer. And here we learn how we ought to make sure that to end our prayers on the note of what is certainly true and what assures us that our prayers can be answered. So these truths... Provide hope after asking for God's help, that he will indeed provide that help. And this conclusion directs our thoughts heavenward so that we know where our prayers are going. It reminds us that we address the God who reigns, the God who is powerful, and the God who is glorious. And we are then enthused for our prayers as we close with a reminder of these these amazing heavenly realities. And so the main point is that the conclusion to the Lord's Prayer gives us encouraging reminder about who has heard our prayers. The conclusion to the Lord's Prayer gives us encouraging reminder about who has heard our prayers. And our three points to help us work through this are questions, quiet, and quick. So first, let's... Sorry, question. One one question. Um, think about question. Um, now, here's the thing. We, we have to tackle a potentially, possibly, uh, tricky question as we come to this, this line. At the end of the Lord's Prayer, if you look at many of the modern translations, including the ESV that we use, this uh, little conclusion, these three items at the end here are not included in the text of Matthew six, where we have the, you know, the standard version 
of the Lord's Prayer. The reason that, it's, that these lines are not included there uh, is because the oldest and most important manuscripts of the New Testaments don't include these lines here. And it seems that they were then sort of uh, inserted there later on. So then we have this question before us. Um, ought we to pray these lines? Um, the fact that I'm preaching on them probably suggests where I'm going to land uh, on that question. Uh, but we probably need something more fulsome than, than just that to get us there. And so I do think that we have good reason to use this conclusion as we form our own prayers. First, uh, which in some ways explain this, this, this consideration is going to explain how these lines ended up where they did in Matthew 6 later on. By way of example, this content is recorded in one of our oldest Christian documents called the Didache. Um, now, the, the thing about this document um, is not inspired, uh, but it's kind of like the very first book of church order. Right. So we have, in fact, I, I have one here, uh, this exciting book called the book of church order. Uh, from for the OPC and and it's a it's a guideline of how to do stuff, how to, how to navigate composing services and that sort of thing. How what's fitting as a directory, uh, you know, to well, prayers might best serve God's people if they look like this and go in this part of the service. And here's a template for how to set up the sacraments and give a preface and how to fence the Lord's Supper, that sort of thing. Well, the Didache was kind of the first one of those in ancient history. And in three different places within the Didache, it marks the Lord's Prayer. And, I mean, it quotes from it and implements it in aspects of Christian worship. And it tells us to close our prayers with content about God's kingdom, power, and glory. And so there's a really ancient historical precedent for using this language. Um, and probably how far back that was in use explains why somebody thought, um, and it's not that big a deal if I just put it right there in Matthew 6 too. Everybody knows we ought to say it um, and it'll be okay. That may not have been the best move, um, but I think that there are still reasons to keep using this. One is the historical precedent. Second, more importantly, more importantly, while this content isn't in Matthew 6, it is in the Bible. We read some really overt um, usage of it, you know, basis for it uh, in First Chronicles 29. Verses 10 to 13. Um, now that prayer is more extensive, but we saw kingdom, power, and glory kind of on rotation as David opened that prayer there. And David prayed in the assembly after offerings had been brought for the construction of the temple. He wouldn't get to construct it, but Solomon uh, would do that. And yet, nonetheless, he's praying for blessing upon these resources. And in this prayer, he prayed, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. And so this conclusion that you know is well known at the end of the Lord's Prayer is a fitting summary of biblical ideas that do belong in our prayer. And they are all, then a fitting way to rest ourselves at the end of our prayers and to hand our concerns over to the Lord. It's a fitting way to bring ourselves to repose and to know that we have given all the things that were on our heart over to the one who should hear them. And in this respect, the conclusion reminds us about God 
as we close our prayers to him, which is the right place to end it. Um, we could just sort of trail off uh, with, with our you know, final petition, but this is a good way, I think a, a fitting way, to end on the note of returning to reflection about God himself. It reminds us, you know, as an answer to that question that so many people have had over the centuries, you know, am I just speaking empty words to the ceiling? And this conclusion reminds us, no, you're not. It reminds us that we have addressed the God who is king, which means he has the authority to answer our prayers. It reminds us that we have prayed to the God who is powerful, which means he has the ability to answer our prayers. He has authority, he has the right to answer our prayers, and he has the power, the ability to answer our prayers. And we have pray- it reminds us that we have prayed to the God who is glorious, which means that he has the reason to answer our prayers. We'll come back to that. And so if our question is, should we pray this conclusion? I think the answer is undoubtedly yes. And that brings us to our second point, quiet. Um, And so how does this conclusion to the Lord's Prayer help us pray now, today? Right? Westminster Shorter Catechism 107 says, The conclusion of the Lord's Prayer, which is, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Teaches us to take our encouragement in prayer from God only. And in our prayers to praise him, ascribing kingdom, power and glory to him. And in testimony of our desire and assurance to be heard, we say, Amen. So the catechism tells us that we should be encouraged in prayer. Because we pray to God alone. And that the final amen at the end of our prayer should also assure us that we have been heard. And this connection is where uh, we have to link application so directly to the, the doctrinal foundation that we just saw. We have addressed the God who is king, so has authority, who is powerful, so has ability, and who is glorious so has the reason to answer our prayers. And all these truths inspire us that prayer matters because of the one who hears us. John Calvin explained, this conclusion is firm and tranquil repose for our faith. For if our prayers were were to be commended to God by our worth, who would dare even mutter in his presence? Now, however miserable we may be, though unworthiest of all, however devoid of all commendation, we will yet never lack a reason to pray. Never be shorn of assurance, since his kingdom, power, and glory can never be snatched away from our Father. As we pray, we have to work through lots of things that need our concern. We have brought burdens of various kinds to the Lord. We have brought burdens about how his name is not kept sacred among too many people, how his kingdom has not, uh, still has growth that needs to occur, how his will needs keeping. We have brought concerns about how we need food, daily provision, how we need forgiveness, and how we need protection. And in some ways, those are all hard realities. And thankfully, the true God who receives those burdens from us has authority, ability, and reason to take them from us. 
He has the right to act for his citizens. He has the strength to overcome our burdens. As he gets credit and praise for giving us victory and deliverance, he has reason to answer us so that he is rightly glorified as the one who rescues us. So this conclusion directs our attention away from the burdens that we have brought to God and points our attention towards the God who relieves and handles our burdens. This conclusion brings quiet to our soul, comforting us that we have left our concerns in the best hands to handle them. That brings us to our final point. Quick. How does this conclusion to the Lord's Prayer point us to Christ? First, it shows us that Christ is ready to use his kingdom, power, and glory for the good of his people. We close our prayer with this sort of reflection because it should remind us that these truths about God resound for our good. They are not toss away as if any any of them could be, but these are not toss away notes about who God is. They tie together who God is and why we pray. These truths about God Make it good and helpful to pray. So let's think about John 15. Um, I'm going to read verse 5 and then 7 and 8. Where Christ says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And now catch this. So he's just said, right, you know, this is about union with Christ, and those in union with Christ, God is going to have them bear fruit. And if you, if you are in union with Christ and his word is in you, well, ask. And God is going to answer that prayer. And this is striking. By this, meaning by this act of God producing the fruit in your life, of answering your prayer, by this act of giving you the things you ask God for, My Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Our union with Christ as branches to a vine means that we are meant for fruit production. (laughs) And part of that fruit production is that we would ask Christ-driven prayers. And astonishingly, this act of praying in union with Christ unto having our prayers answered is bearing fruit. To have our prayers answered is bearing fruit. What a thing. And and that... uh, (laughs) God coming through for you, for things you need, is, is Him giving evidence in your life that you're His disciple. I think so often we, I mean, it is true that when we walk faithfully before the Lord, that's also fruit. And that's evidence that we are the Lord's disciples. And it shows the world that. And here, we kind of see the other side of that. When God answers your prayer, when God helps you when you're in need, That's also proof that you're his disciple and testimony to the world that you belong to him. 
And as he answers prayer in, in a way that is bearing fruit in your life that glorifies the Father, well, so we pray because, because God expands His kingdom, shows His power, and glorifies Himself by answering our prayers. And that reality happens in Christ. And hence, Christ is the, the basis. He's, he's the ground. He, he is the, the foundation, the thing that holds everything else up when it comes to our prayers. Our prayers stand and hold together because Christ is at their bottom. We are able to come before God in prayer because we abide in Christ by faith. To extend that point further for how this conclusion to the Lord's Prayer points us to Christ, we should not overlook that final little word, Amen. And this word, Amen, I mean, there's probably lots of times that you've heard something similar. But here's the thing. We, we need um, to make sure that we're really attentive to the significance, the meaningfulness of this little word that sort of puts the period at the end of our prayers. It is not uh, like, like the whole conclusion here. It is not some throwaway aspect of our prayer. It is not some ending that, that we just made up to tack on to know that we're done. As if, you know, pick a different word to, to let everybody know you're finished and that'll do just as well. That's not the case. This word means truly. Or, or perhaps more aptly, let it be so. Let it be true. It is itself a petition that God would hear us and respond to his people. And in that respect, we have to remember that the reason that our prayers can be heard, the reason that God can be good to us and answer us is because of Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 1, 19 and 20, Paul explained, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, was not yes and no, but in Him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes. In him. That is why it is through him that we utter, don't catch that, it, why we utter through him our Amen to God for his glory. I think, so, I think uh, the way we run up to our Amen, people think that's up for grabs too. And, and it is um, admittedly one of my pet peeves to hear very popular preachers ad lib and, and try to come up with very creative substitutes for in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I, I will revise my comments in writing some other time. <laughs> it bothers me. <laughs> we'll put it that way. Because Paul is very clear that the run-up to amen is not up for grabs. It is very specific. It is through Christ, for Christ's sake, in the name of Christ, because He is the mediator, that we say, Amen. We appeal to Christ as the final reason that we might say, let it be so. 
Christ is the reason that God says yes to our prayers. He is the yes and amen of all God's promises and all God's provisions. Jesus is the mediator who he died on the cross to forgive our sin. He is the savior who he rose from death to secure indestructible life for all who believe in him. And because he rose from the grave, he ascended into heaven to intercede for us. And it is because he is there, risen in indestructible life forever, interceding for us. Because of that, as Paul said, we glorify God as we bring our prayers in Christ's name. Jesus the perfect and risen Savior, deserves to have, and catch this, this is the big connection, why all assurance belongs inside your prayers. Because Jesus, the perfect and risen Savior, He deserves to have every single one of His prayers answered. He deserves for the Father to hear every word He has to say. And so we make sure that we pray in Christ's name because he is then the one who carries all of our prayers before the divine throne. And so it is Jesus why we are heard. And it is because of Jesus that we know that God does hear us. And it is Christ who is the reason why God can be quick to answer yes to our amen. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we have been in some ways on a long journey through the Apostles' Creed, the Ten Commandments, and the Lord's Prayer. Uh, These three fundamental building blocks to thinking through the Christian life, what we ought to believe, how we ought to respond And how we ought to pray. And as we come to the end of these three series, these three structuring uh, aspects of how we know you and walk with you, might you bless not only our studies in the Lord's Prayer, but all three of these series. That as we have considered, well, the doctrinal foundations, the, proc- the, the statement of our faith, as we have considered your rule for how we ought to live, and as we have considered this profile for prayer, might you inculcate all three of them more deeply into our lives. And as we round out this study on Christ's model for prayer, might we be encouraged to seek after you, knowing that if we abide in him and his word abides in us, we ask whatever we wish and you will grant it to us. And so, would you first remind us of the joy of abiding in Christ by faith? Would you second cause his word to abide richly and abundantly in each of us that we might know well and wisely what to ask and might we bear fruit of answered prayers first because we have prayed and second because we have prayed well in light of all that we know about who you are and what your will for our lives and for your kingdom would be. And so, of course, might we always end rejoicing because we know the reason why you hear us. In Christ, we have yes and amen to all of your promises. In Christ, we have the reason you hear us and respond to us. And so we ask all of these things In his name. Amen. People of God, would you stand to receive your benediction? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen.
Good to be with you today.